Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. All right. So let's move on, talk a little bit of author stuff. And we have an interesting uh, topic, which I think some people may totally understand. Before we get to that, though, uh, you've written several books at this point. Uh, so what are some things that you have learned on your journey that you're doing different now than you used to do? Don't rush it. Don't try to force it. If you get blocked up, go do something else. And don't don't push through it. You're just going to be beating your head against a wall. That's probably the most obvious thing I could say. But it's true. Because... First go around my first book, Catch an Odyssey, I, I hit some pretty hard blocks and would just sit there and pound my head against the keyboard for hours trying to figure it out. And it didn't work. And it got to a point where I pretty much gave up on the book and walked away for a couple of weeks. And yeah, it still bugged me. It's in the back of my head like a bee in a mason jar trying to figure itself out but I wasn't focused on it so hard. And when I came back to it, I wrote eight chapters in two hours. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you can't, you can't force it. Yeah. There's a certain point at where it's fine to sit and fight your way through a problem, but at some point you just got to take a break. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. My, my first book, I still love the concept and the idea, but I really didn't know what I was doing. Thought I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, it's still kind of sitting around. It's got a few good things in it, but there's a lot of stuff that my editor went through and I literally ripped half the book out, 35,000 words. It's like, eh, okay, these Oof. are not. But I kept them because the individual scenes could be reworked and used at some point if I do that yeah. series. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but the, the general overall book, and I think, the books I've got now are just way better. So people are like, oh, but haven't you gone back to it? Like, no, I haven't because it hasn't really called me back. You know, <laughs> uh, the, the stuff I'm doing now is just so it's so much better and it's drawn me in and it's good. You know, yeah. I just not, don't have the impetus to go back. Well, I've so. even noticed that in my own work, like from the first draft, first attempt at Catron Odyssey, my work has evolved a ton to where I am now, still early in my author childhood, as it were, but 300,000 <laughs> words later, and it's barely recognizable. So I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. I've figured out what not to do and quit doing it. And <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm new pretty new also. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not the experienced wise writer, but yeah. I've been doing it for a couple of years now and I've realized a couple of things. And whenever I get people on, you know, whatever social media or Facebook or at a conference or something in there, they're like, well, I'm working on my first book. I've got a couple chapters done, but tell me about publishing. Tell me about this. And it's like, eh, no, forget all of that. Just sit and write. You need to just write, 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 and write a ton. Get a book done and don't even go, oh, now I can publish. Write another book. Because really, if you write a couple books and you write a couple short stories, you'll be so much better off when you finally do go into publishing them than yes. trying to rush that first one. That's yes. my advice I give people now. <laughs> and don't underestimate the power of flash fiction and writing prompts. Because even in the middle of my projects, I have Facebook groups that I'm part of. I have Discord servers that I'm part of and that all have like a weekly prompt where you it's an image or 10 words or one sentence or whatever. And you have to write 500 words, a thousand words, whatever, based on that. And do it if you 
have an idea, don't do it if you don't. But those sort of things will force you out of the box that is your current work in progress, but still keep the wheels turning, keep the juices flowing. And for me, those have been an absolutely massive help. I have another whole document full of these prompts that I've written and liked and gone, that's a short story. That's a short story. That's a novella. I could probably turn that into a whole book. Like it just, because it it creates ideas and ideas are money in this business. So it's, it's important. And I agree. The more you can do that's out of your comfort zone, even a little bit, the better you'll become. I, I agree. And that's both of us still being new compared to a lot of other authors out there. Right. Yeah, exactly. You so got to start Derek, somewhere. Absolutely. And I think people get, like you said, they rush too much. They don't yes. rush it. You'll be better off because what happens is they rush it and they're in the exact same spot and boat five years down the road as they would have been if they would have just wrote and wrote and wrote and concentrated on that. But they don't see it. You know, I didn't see it. It's, you know, hindsight. So it's absolutely um, hindsight. Yeah. Learn from us. Anyone listening, learn from us. We're new enough to be able to say this. <laughs> exactly. I'm I'm the old farm mule who will fight through anything and not learn anything else. And I learn by doing. I You can't tell me not to do something. I have to go do it and get hurt and figure it out myself. So um, don't be me. <laughs> Listen to the people who have done this before you. It's a long line of brilliant people and pay attention, learn something. A long they, line they of made the mistake people. so you don't have to. Right, right. A long line of brilliant people, which may not include us. We're not saying Probably we're the brilliant not. people. <laughs> uh, so Derek, uh, when you're writing, what software and services do you like to use? I use the uh, I use readsy.com. I use their editor for all of my drafting okay. and editing and a wow. lot of things. Okay. I, I pretty much live live there. Um, I absolutely love it. I tried Scrivener. I couldn't do it. It was too complicated for me. I'm very much a um, what George Martin would call a gardener. Uh, I, I don't outline. I don't plan. So that whole three quarters of Scrivener was lost on me. And Readsy had everything else in an easy platform. Everything's cloud-based. I can grab it from my phone, my tablet, my desktop, my laptop, whatever, whenever, and everything's right there. So it's super handy for me because I jump around a lot from different machines trying to get work done and I can just pull it up anywhere and it's there. It formats it as you write to look like a book. So you're not fighting with weird formatting later and it's great. For anybody starting out or anybody who's on the go a lot, I highly recommend Reedsy. <laughs> I like that. You're actually the first author out of 130 episodes that has said that and recommended Reedsy. And I find it also interesting that we talked earlier about programming and it, it, you were having trouble struggling with it. The reason I believe I glommed on to Scrivener so well is because it really spoke to my analytical programmer brain. It just made sense. People are like, oh, it took me so long to learn Scrivener. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I opened it up and I was like, I, I just did it. It made sense to me. Yeah. So no, it I, makes I, sense to me. I just don't have a use for 90% of what's there. I, I have, I think, five pages total of outline between two full length novels And that's handwritten in a notebook because I got stuck and needed to figure out a continuity problem. Um, That's a good way. I have no outlines. I have no outlines. I have a doc with a list of like names and pronunciations and like basic stuff just to keep my head straight. And that's it. I I don't plan. I don't. mm -mm. I don't do that. So I, I don't need the database and the wiki and all the craziness of what a lot of people need and use. I, I've been using a lot of the features of Scrivener because I focus a lot on wanting kids to learn to write and encouraging kids to write and uh, tools and information to help teachers and parents to help kids to write. Mm-hmm. So I actually mm-hmm. have been creating a Bible for my world so I can keep it all straight and connected yeah. correctly. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it's a great tool. I'm not discounting Scrivener at all. It's a fantastic tool. It's just not right for me. The, yeah, right. There's the, the bottom line. What w works for one person may not work for another. And, you know, don't use a tool just because your favorite author said that's what they use. It may not work for you. Right. And you'll struggle right. and be frustrated and it, it won't be any good. Yeah. Everybody's different. I have friends who write their books longhand with fountain pens in handmade leather journals. And I have friends who wouldn't know what to do without Scrivener. And I know people who use <laughs> Microsoft Word 1997 running on a potato. You <laughs> know, Clippy. it just, yeah, Clippy was awesome though. Um, <laughs> but bring back Clippy. Um, I'm surprised they yeah, haven't it, actually. <laughs> right. It, it's a nostalgia thing at this point. But, um, yeah, everybody's different. Everybody uses different tools. You know, you go to a construction site, you're going to see DeWalt, Milwaukee, Makita, you know, everybody has a different tool that they prefer and that's fine. It all does right. the same thing. It just does it differently. It's whatever you can use to get what you need. Yep. Agreed. Yep. Derek, what are you doing to uh, market your books? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be brutally honest. My marketing consists of word of mouth, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, basically social media. And that's pretty much it. And the podcast. I was going to say, does the podcast, do you think, help uh, bring light to your books? Um, For the 20 people that listen to it? Yeah. <laughs> they know about it. Um, well, it, maybe we're we just can get a few out. more listings. We, got five or six episodes at this point so it's it's nothing huge yet we're we started the ball rolling late on that but um it's still a lot of fun um yeah i don't do enough um i really don't it's pretty much social okay. media okay um, but i also have zero right. budget to promote anything so <laughs> <laughs> right what you can do right all right so you mentioned talking about being a reluctant author and how you really didn't think about being an author. You hadn't really wanted necessarily to always be an author, but you did it anyway. So you mentioned earlier, let, let's repeat that, I guess. Why did you say, okay, I've got to write this? So my world, my characters, my stories all started out in one place, which is the black hole in my brain that is filled by D&D. Um, I was working on a Dungeons and Dragons campaign for a bunch of friends of mine. I do, do a lot of homebrew, make everything up myself, and basically just hang it on that D&D &D framework um, to create a playable world. Well, it got to a point where the world was awesome, the concept was awesome, but my characters were too specific to want to throw to the wolves, as it were, of my players. And my plot was getting a little out of control for a campaign and have it be efficient. So it, it essentially outgrew and ended up being too big and too small in different ways to be a D&D &D campaign. So it also wouldn't leave me alone. It got hung in, the, hung in my head and wouldn't go away. And I told myself, screw it, I'm going to write it down. I'll write a book. Maybe I can actually finish something this time. Because um, I'm horrible about finishing big projects. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I ended up with a book that was intended to be one book, was intended to sit on my shelf and nobody else's as a trophy just to prove that I did it. I got my trophy, I put it on my shelf, and it kept bugging me because my story wasn't finished. So I wrote another one. <laughs> and another. And now what was supposed to be one book is looking like it's going to be a trilogy with a bunch of side branches, which we talked about. And what started as proving to myself that I could do something is now, well, what about this sci-fi project? And what about this historical fantasy project? And what about this lit RPG project? And what about this other thing? And Ooh, that's an idea. Look, shiny. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> right. Right. Um, 
I, I feel like a lot of people can relate to that, whether they be artists or writers or musicians or whatever. You you start with one thing and end up with a hundred more, and it's both helpful and not. <laughs> right, and and I think that's important for others to hear because I've heard other people say, "Oh, I'm not a writer. I couldn't write a book," and sometimes it just takes a matter of sitting down and starting to type or scribble or whatever it is. Uh, and you may find that it calls to you. That That's the only way to describe it. When, when I, when I really hit upon that story, that's really just buzzing along and clicking. It's not so much like I'm thinking of what to write. It's like, I'm peeling back to another universe, another dimension. And, and I'm looking in and seeing what they're doing and I'm just writing it down. It's like it channels into me. You know, and I I think when people get that feeling, then you can't stop them. (laughs) Yeah, I'm an extremely visual person. I have a background in art, graphic design, music. I'm very creative, artsy person, and I'm extremely visual. You say something gross in front of me, I'm going to picture it before it's all the way out of your mouth. I'm that guy. So for me, when I'm writing, I'm seeing a movie in my head and I'm just doing my best to translate. That's all it is, which is part of why I think they would be better suited as movies because I've already seen that movie and it was pretty darn good. (laughs) So, um, it's it, it like, that's, that's what it is for me. Like you said, you're just peeling back the layers and explaining what's going on. That's about it. And it, very much is a creative process and it very much is something that a lot of people don't realize they're capable of until they actually try to do it. Right. Absolutely. Do you, uh, do you think your background with D and D helped and you, cause you don't have any writing training. You just started to write. Yeah. Um, the D and D pretty much, I, at this point, consider my time as a dungeon master, game master, whatever version of that term you prefer, um, as a practice run. The thing is, I didn't really write much of that down. I just pulled it out of my head, which is the same thing I do to my books. Right. (laughs) I don't really write it down or plan it out. I might go, okay, we need to go here, 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 and here in that order, and then we need to end up over here somehow. And like that's my outline you're like okay start middle and i want this thing to happen that's a cool scene we'll put that in there somewhere and you know that's that's how i write my books that's how i brand my D games and it was basically a dry run except now it doesn't just go away at the end of the night <laughs> right so have you been concerned about uh the imposter syndrome or do you feel like oh i'm not really a writer i don't know what i'm doing uh did that uh, uh, like affect you or has you, have you gone through times when you're just like, I can't write cause I'm no good or anything like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Every single day <laughs> <laughs> Okay. For the last two years. Yes. Every day. Um, I think what really helped me through that the most was realizing that a, I'm not the only one and B the big famous authors that you look at as people who can do nothing wrong and know exactly what they're doing. They have it too. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Tolkien had it. Lewis had it. Sanderson has it. Martin has it. Everybody deals with it at some point. J.K. Rowling. I'm just rattling off fantasy people because that's what I know. But everybody <laughs> deals with it at some point. Uh, and, it's, and it's like writer's yeah, block. It's inevitable. Right. And having an MFA and studying word stru- or sentence structure doesn't necessarily help you write a good story. Uh, those are things no, that it'll probably make it worse. I agree. But writing a good story has nothing to do with grammar or spelling or anything like that. They're, they're, they're actually separate. That's what you editors learn... are for. Yeah, exactly. You can learn grammar, you can learn spelling, but it's much harder to learn to tell a good story. Yes, I would agree with that. And, and we see it with little kids all the time. Oh, 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 let me tell you a story. And well, I, I was walking down the street and, and there was a pebble and I, I picked it up and then I went and I, I threw the pebble. And it's like, oh my God, where is this story going? You know, uh, that's because they're still learning and they're, they're figuring yeah. out story. And I think a lot of people get in their head, oh, I need to, um, you know, 
take classes. I need to be taught. What What do you play? You said you play music. Um, it, I hand it to me. I'll make it make noise. Okay. I, I, I grew probably, up in the same house as a music teacher, so. <laughs> okay, you probably had some lessons, but at some point yeah. you start playing and you start making music and playing other instruments without all that behind you. You know, some of the best rock musicians didn't have lessons necessarily. Exactly. Exactly. Now, if you're a doctor, no, I, I, please go get trained and take classes. Yes. If you're a doctor. <laughs> if you're new and whether you're writing fantasy or not, I would highly recommend that you go on YouTube and watch Brandon Sanderson's BYU lectures. Yes. They're free. They're amazing. Uh, start at the beginning and go through. It's going to take you a while, but yes. do it. I learned a ton just from his introduction, let alone the rest of it. <laughs> right. And, um, and he puts them up for tons free. Tons of information. Yeah. Yeah, he does, which is an absolute service to the industry. And Absolutely. I appreciate that very much. Um, but yeah, I learned a ton. And it's basically you're auditing a college class. Listen, yes. watching those or listen to those. So do that if you feel like you need lessons. Go watch that. It's free. You don't have to go to school. It's fine. Um, your computer, your phone, your TV, whatever. Good enough. Agreed. I, I love that. All right. Well, Derek, uh, it's been really great talking to you. Um, yeah. So a before good time. we wrap, before we wrap up, uh, do you have any last minute advice other than everything we've already talked about uh, for some new authors? Just go out and tell your story. Whether you feel like you're worthy or not, just do it. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers. I did some digging into statistics about writers a while back. And essentially something like if you complete a book, you're in like 2% of the world population that will ever complete a book. And that's regardless of publishing, regardless of anyone ever reading it, if you complete it, You've done something that 98% of the world will never do. If you just write it down and start it and don't finish it, you're in like 12%. So it's, it's a feeling of accomplishment knowing that. And I'm not saying just do it to be special. I'm saying if you have a story in your head and you want to tell it, get past the imposter of going, I'm not good enough for this and just go tell your story. Everybody has a story. If you have one, go tell it. Agreed. I love that. All right, Derek, thank you uh, for getting on tonight. Uh, for Absolutely. me, it's, it's, it's dark. <laughs> so it's been uh, dark here, <laughs> right? It's that time of year. So oh, yeah. I, I wish you luck on your books and uh, hopefully we'll see you write some more coming soon. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, if you enjoyed this episode of Discovered Wordsmiths, please support the author. Go to their website, go to Amazon, look them up, get the book. And if you click on the link that I have in the show notes, you'll also help support the podcast so I can keep the hosting and all the software I use and uh, keep it running for, to help more authors. When I am recording this, we've got over 100 episodes, lots of authors. Go to the website, discoveredwordsmiths.com. Check it out. There's a lot of great authors, probably in some genre that you love. See what they have. Check out their books. That's what the point of the podcast is for. So people can discover new authors, find some new books they love, support the authors so they can continue writing. So please support them. And if you do like the podcast, if you've been thinking of podcasting or you're a writer, I've got some links also at the website. Click on those if you're interested in any of the software or services that I talk about. Everything that I have there is something I use, so I've got an affiliate link. Again, it's a little bit, if everyone clicked on those, if they were going to get it anyway, it helps keep the podcast going. So let's all help each other out and discover more, so, sorry, discover more, discover more authors to read. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.